What is different about HR professionals and therefore how to sell to them? Well, hello and welcome to How to Sell to HR. My name is Roger Corville and welcome to another episode of V2's Thought Leader Conversations series. You know that here at V2, we specialize in taking a really specific use case. How do we help you dial in how you want to connect with people and pairing that with the platform that helps you meet your goals? But that's not got anything to do with today because today's simply about you and what you can learn from a legit expert in social selling and virtual selling and selling to HR. Uh, my friend Phil Gerbashak is a sales and leadership expert with over 25 years of experience providing solutions to prospects and teammates in SaaS and financial services and professional services industries. He currently serves as the sales enablement consultant for Bamboo. HR, where he trains and coaches leaders and consultants to serve HR leaders in small and mid-sized businesses. But more importantly, or as importantly, Paul, Phil also uh, hosts the Sales Leadership Show, a live video show broadcast to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter several times a week. And when he's not serving leaders and sales reps, he's also a husband, a bonus dad, a pinball wizard. I love this guy. Welcome, Phil Gerbishak. (laughs) Hey, thanks, Roger. I love you too, man. It's great to be here with you. You know, uh, as we close in on the holidays, though someone very well might be um, viewing this after the fact, I have to ask, I would imagine HR folks have a lot on their plate, particularly since COVID hit, right? Every demographic or psychographic that you wish to reach has something that is unique about them. Curious, what, where do you begin with selling to HR? What, what is the way that you even think about getting inside their unique world? Well, I, I think first you have to start by understanding that they're responsible for the people side. And some organizations, they call it human capital. And those are HR professionals that are really tough, right? Because they have to look at each person more as a capital expenditure more and, instead of a person. So we have to know that there's tension there. Right, we have to know that there's tension there between the finance and the and the people side, um, and to really get inside them, especially as we either look at year end or the beginning of the year. Right, we know that at year end we've got uh, for many organizations that don't have a perpetual performance plan. Year end is the one time that all their managers say, "Holy crap, I gotta talk about how my people are," and maybe uh, we have to talk about raises and uh, bonuses and all of that good stuff because. Your best people are your best people all the time. And that's a tension again between, okay, well, the or company's not doing as well as maybe they'd like, but doggone it, if we lose our best people, well, we're really not going to do good next year. So we, that's a lot of tension. And we have to know not only that, but then they have to look inside of their organization, into HR, into their team, and what does their team need? And so there's a – HR is – I think the the most underappreciated piece of most businesses because they have to have an eye on finance, they have to have a big eye on people, they have to look inside their organization, then they have to look out and see, okay, well, what is my, what's the, what are my peers doing? What's my competition doing? What's all this? And let's continue to do more with less. Great resignation, recession, holy crap, and here we go, right? So that's a lot, but you have to pick one of those and try to see if that resonates. And that's really important because you can't talk to all of it at first. You have to pick one and talk directly to that person and share with them some of your heart and your experience and what's going on so that you can serve them. Because if they don't think you understand their world, and frankly, a lot of sales reps don't, They don't even try sometimes. They just have a canned pitch. If that happens, you're never going to sell to HR. It's going to be a long day. That's for sure. Right. You know, uh, a a dear business partner of mine used to say, you can manage numbers or you can manage people. And what you just described is, is dead on, right? It's that tension between the realities of running a business and attempting to take care of all the stakeholders. And at the same time, I'm guessing most people get into HR because they love people and they want to take care of people and, and want to see people succeed and, and, and have some gift for being able to, to 
tap into how do we optimize and help people grow so that we can get where we need to go as a company because every company needs people. Yeah, and every company needs great people. Let's be clear. And your point about growth is super important, right? They're either passionate about people from a heart-centered or focused about people on their brain and the growth-centered. And the best HR professionals balance those two well and know that it's a whole person that has to grow in order to help the organization grow. So I know you do a lot of sales training, and I'm just going to say this again, even though it was kind of in your bio. Um, I've known Phil a good long time, and and he's not one of those people that calls himself a social selling expert because it's part of his Twitter profile. I mean, this dude's, you know, the legit bees ness. And so I just want to frame up this next thing because I, I know your heart for people. But my question is this, when it comes to perhaps even doing that pre-work that leads to what you were talking about before, where do I even begin to figure out how I'm going to connect with the professional that I'm attempting to reach and sell? Where do I even begin? Assuming well, the salesperson has a heart to begin in the right place, as opposed to going, hey, Phil, uh, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's not it, right? So that's definitely not it. Um, first, you know, I, I think you have to think about the person. And you can look, uh, you can do a Google search, you can look on LinkedIn, maybe they posted something. Most HR professionals don't because they get swarmed. So they don't post a whole lot. But you can look there, you can start there. So look at the person. First, you do that Google search, you could see, if you click on if you go to Google, you put in their name, put it in quotes. So you hit their exact name, if they have a common name, add their city. Go to the news tab. Sometimes they're in the news, not always for work stuff. A lot of times they're involved in, they, they're maybe uh, athletic, right? So you might see they did a 5K. And athletic being, a, I should put that in air quotes, because you don't have to be hyper-athletic to run a 5K or a 10K or even a marathon, right? You just have to commit to doing the work. So you might see them there. You might see them involved in their church. You might see them involved in their kids' stuff. You're going to be able to see what's important about right? You might see that they attended a conference. You might see that they got an award, something like that. So I would start there. Now, assuming that nothing's there, then you'd look at the company. What's happening with the company? I'd look at the, the company's LinkedIn, the company's Facebook, because of course, you know, good organizations want to celebrate their employees. They want to put out good content. They want to help people see that they're a place that people want to work, regardless <clears throat> of what else is going on. So they're going to put that out. We're going to look at the company. Then we're going to look at their community, right? We're going to look at their community. What's happening if they're a local, per, uh, you know, local organization? What's helping, happening in their community, right? What's happening in, uh, you know, in Fargo, North Dakota that might be uh, improving business or making business worse? Um, and then, you know, last but not least, we might look at that industry, right? We might look at that industry and see, okay, is that industry growing or contracting? Has there been more research poured into that? Because again, all of those things, but starting with the person, moving uh, from the person to the organization, from the organization to the community, to, from the community to the industry. And you don't have to spend all day, right? Just five minutes or so on a person will tell us a lot. And then really think about it. Like, is there a connection for you? If you're in sales, right? And, and it has to relate. Let's be clear. It has to relate to what you sell. I can't say, oh, gee, Raj, I see you like the color green. You want to buy a monkey? And you're like, what? Where did that come from? Right. You know, that's not it. It's got to, you got to find a way to connect that. So, um, and it's hard, right? It's hard. It's not easy. But the best sales reps, the best sales professionals actually take the time to do that. Because when you approach it that way, you have an opportunity to really connect and really to serve. I imagine you have better tactics up your sleeve than me, but I once heard someone describe a why you, why now kind of intro, right? Um, hey, Phil, one of the things that I notice is that your industry is experiencing blah, and the reason I'm reaching out now is, or, you know, something of that nature. Just to get a curiosity, yeah. do you follow a particular okay. methodology, sales methodology, or how do you how do you work someone through thinking how to get from that investigation on through to, to connecting and communicating. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we, we follow a, we follow a, a methodology, uh, for sure. Right. And I teach a methodology, right. First, we got to be engaging, right. We want to break the ice a little bit for sure. 
And then we do some discovery, right? Ask some questions uh, with that, right? Ask some questions, find that out from there. Uh, hopefully we get an opportunity to kind of to show uh, how we might be able to solve a problem, right? And then in discovery, we have to figure that out. Uh, what What is that, right? And then last but not least, right? We have to actually move the ball forward, right? We wanna uh, execute on another call, execute on closing the deal, execute on, well, we're not a fit. So um, that's the methodology that I typically follow that we work through inside of that, knowing that that feels really linear. We, we know that we have to discover throughout, right? We have to always be asking questions, always be curious. Curiosity permeates that. Every point we have to ask questions, make sure we understand, you know, restate some of that conversation, find out is that the only thing that they need in order to move forward and then let's prescribe and move forward. So, um, you know, that's not a, I, I don't know that there's a, a specific name uh, for all of that, right? But certainly that's the methodology that we, that, you know, that we use at Bamboo. That's the methodology, you know, that I've, that I've attempted to train, um, at, you know, for, for a long time, because I really think, you know, again, people first, if we don't engage and we don't discover and we don't know what the real problem is. And I forgot to say this, but super important, right? What's the impact of that problem? That's kind of the why now, right? And what's the impact of not solving the problem? Right. Well, right. Once we can figure all of that out, well, if we have it, we can move forward. If we don't, well, then we're, well, there's probably not a fit, right? Then there's not a now, then there's no urgency. Um, and then as a sales rep, right, then we have to dig a little harder and see well, maybe they don't realize the urgency because they're not the decision maker. Um, you know, in HR, sometimes it's a team of people that decide. So they might they might have been told that there is an urgency, but they might not understand it. So you might have to get other people involved in that. So you might, and the bigger the company that that you're selling to, right, the more people get involved because you have to de-risk the the problem, right? You have to de-risk the solution and make sure that uh, you know that that everybody is fed because as budgets get tight, you have to find something that doesn't just solve a problem, but it solves a few problems. How often, how often is the person in HR the decision maker? The only decision maker? Very seldom. Well, I'll you know, let you qualify it however you'd like. A, yeah, yeah, no, no, but right. So the decision maker, very seldom. Um, simply because um, they don't often have the final uh, sign off, right? So you're still probably going to have to get a neat, uh, thumbs up from someone in finance. You want, in a small business, right? You might have to get a thumbs up from an owner. Uh, with that, as the business grows, IT sometimes gets involved, right? Legal sometimes gets involved. Sometimes, you know, again, the owner, the CEO gets involved, the CFO. Sometimes you might have an outside consultant uh, that gets involved. Uh, so I would say HR is often a decision maker is someone who, and, and definitely someone who can give you a big thumbs down and say, that's not it. We're not doing that. Um, but seldom are they the only decision maker. And I would say that's often true unless you're selling directly to uh, the owner or the CEO at a small ish company, because purposely you surround yourself with experts right so you need those experts to weigh in so so even though you know this is talking about selling to hr we have to sell with hr we have to equip hr to help us navigate through the organization which they're experts at by the way that's hr loves people so they're experts they know and if we partner with them they often can tell us things that we're not gonna be able to find otherwise. So part of, you know, you talked about social selling before. Part of social selling, Raj, is to be social and to ask questions and develop relationships inside an organization so that I don't have to do all that research. I can say, well, okay, well, you're, you're meeting, I'm meeting with, uh, with Jan tomorrow. What, what can you tell me about Jan? And then ask some specific questions that can really help you because HR knows this stuff. I was looking for a sound effect because I just wanted to put a big exclamation point behind something you said that just gave me chills. That's the best that I've got right there. Um, difference between selling to HR and selling with 
HR. What a beautiful distinction, right? Because in, in unless, and to me, I think of that as, as like the distinction between transactional sales and relational sales, right? Where to your point, if there's, other people involved in, right? There's the business decision maker, there's the technical decision maker, or however your organization brings it down. I mean, unless you're just dialing for dollars and one and done, if you're a pro, most of the time, there's going to be multiple people involved in making any sort of significant decision. And whether that's budget, authority, timing, technical, whatever, it, that's a beautiful distinction that I think is worth um, just putting an exclamation point behind. Just out of curiosity, I, since I've known you for a while and your scope of, of expertise is broader than just HR, is there a social selling angle to the rest of that process? I presume that that same kind of investigation that you described when getting used to, you know, sussing out your target, who you're going to approach, how you're going to approach them. I would imagine that serves you in the rest of the, uh, you know, the rest of the, uh, the process, right? Are, th are there any other nuances there? Well, so you have to also understand their personality, right? And how they make decisions. So uh, I'm, I'm simple. I like a two by two, right? Really simple. <laughs> so if you can imagine, right, just a, just a, you know, up and down line and then, and a, a horizontal and a vertical line, you know, are they, are they people or are they task, right? So do they talk about people or do they talk about the task? And then are they fast or are they slow, right? How do they do that? Otherwise, everything else is, you know, and I would say even in HR, right? Everything else is, is still absolutely present. But I'd also say know that some people rely on their peers, on their uh, people like them, the reviews that they get a review site like a G2 if you're in software, right? And other review sites, maybe Glassdoor if they're a candidate and you're in recruiting or other things like that that rate things. Uh, you know, if you're a consumer, right? People look at Amazon ratings or Yelp or Google Maps, right? If you're a if you're a restaurant, um, so know that some rely more on that, and some they think they're the single smartest person on the planet and they're gonna make that decision for themselves and then they're gonna look for validation other places. So that's where a, a, you know, a case study can come in, uh, can help with that relationship, right? Can help with that because if I call someone and say, hey, I'm friends with Roger Corville. Well, if Roger, if you're actually friends with them, they're gonna take my call and the wall's gonna come down and I, we're gonna have a real conversation. And if I say instead, well, I'm friends with, uh, you know, some rando that I'm connected with on LinkedIn that neither one of us know, they're going to be like, and so what? Right. So I think that's really important uh, to, and that's one of the reasons why LinkedIn is, is so good because it's not just, yay, I can connect everybody, but it's more, yay, I can see who Roger knows. So I can have a conversation with Raj and say, hey, how well do you know Kevin Farashi O'Malley? How well do you know this person? And many times it is, will you make an introduction to me? Will you connect them to me? Again, social, he kind of uh, equipped that, if you will, or empowered that or made that more visible, which is why, you know, connect the people that you know, but also social in the fact of, why don't we all get a coffee? Why don't we all get on a Zoom call? Why don't we all have a conversation, right? Why don't we all chat? and catch up, be social first, focus on business second, right? Because now, now I'm gonna get that information. I might find out that, you know, Kevin doesn't even have a need for this, but you know, Kevin knows somebody who does. And that's super helpful. As you're kind of evaluating their world and the way they think about making decisions, just to continue that conversation, how do, how do HR people tend to value things? And let me share with you kind of the presupposition behind the scenes, right? When you do a total cost of ownership kind of an analysis, there are hard costs and soft costs or, you know, hard impacts and soft impacts. Put in a dollar, save two dollars. But oftentimes, particularly in the people business, and I see this because a good chunk of my world was working in human capital on the training side, 
oftentimes the the major impacts are in the soft costs. Hey, if we cut that process that used to take us, you know, it takes us three weeks to get it done, and then we can cut that to a week and a half, that has financial impact if you can isolate, measure, and monetize whatever that is. Sometimes that's beyond someone's ability or willingness to do. I'm just curious, how do they tend to frame up value? Well, that what you said there is, is one way, right? Productivity, output, if you will. You know, how many widgets more can we make? For sure, <clears throat> that's one. Uh, secondly, is as far as career pathing goes, less lower level skills being done by humans is better for a career path, right? People want, they want to stretch their brain, right? They want to work harder at stuff that is harder. They don't want to work harder at stuff that could easily be automated or done that way. So that's important, right? Remove those obstacles. That is certainly a cost as well. Um, Another cost is, okay, well, um, I lost, uh, maybe if it's an all paper process, maybe I lost Uh, somebody's PTO and and ended up, it ticked off our best salesperson and they quit. And now we have a hard cost of, I got to replace this person who was making it rain because I hosed them over for the last time, right? So that's a hard cost as well. And maybe we got sued, right? Maybe we got sued because we didn't have the right, uh, we didn't have the right records retention or we couldn't produce information fast enough. So that's another challenge for folks uh, in HR, not to mention just the overall, um, you know, like a net promoter score. How happy are people to work here? Well, if if it takes them a long time to do just kind of common stuff, well, they're probably not as happy as they could be. Or or you might be losing candidates because it takes you, you know, 12 weeks to, to, uh, from, from, I submitted an application or even I, I saw your job posting on the grocery store to now I finally got hired. Top candidates aren't waiting that long. But if I can shorten that up or I can increase the number of applicants that I get for a job opening and now I have better applicants or even just more applicants, those are all things that HR pros really think about and are able to report back. But a lot of times, again, they're stuck in the mud of doing the the daily task that they can't even raise up to be more strategic. So that's a you know that's a measurement as well because no HR pro wants to be stuck doing one thing. Even if they're an HR department of one, they want to seat at the table, right? They want to grow their career. They're not trying to just do this little job and that's it for their whole life. And by little I don't mean unimportant. I mean you know, there's bigger stuff they could be doing, right? They just because they're in HR doesn't mean that they couldn't be a, a C level executive in some other team or they couldn't run a company or something like that. But if they never get out of data entry, well heck, then that's really tough, right? Yeah, you and you just in passing mentioned something and I'm like, oh yeah, I think I even missed that in asking asking a question. Um I'll preface it by saying this in my career, the way that I was taught to think about how executives make decisions, thinking about senior executives is four things, right? Increase revenue, decrease cost, improve time to X, right? Time to market, time to result and reduce risk. And if there is somebody who understands risk, it's HR. And you mentioned, um, I don't think you, that's not the word you used. I forget what word you used. But if there is a, a general outsider observation on my part, I've often experienced HR being more about risk avoidance than opportunity pursuit. Is that a fair yeah. characterization? And or how do, you, how do you balance that? Hey, here's the opportunity. Here's all the things you could do more productively and whatever. How do you balance that with the fact that... Um, their their spidey sense for risk and litigation or whatever is is probably the highest in the company. Yeah, well, I to your point, right? The the key word there is balance, right? It, I don't think it used to be that HR would really be focused on risk, just risk, right? Like um, I've always got the company's back. I'm always going to do that. But I'll tell you, you know, as we see, um, you know, again, good candidates 
have their pick of where to be and they have they want to be treated like people they don't just want to be treated like numbers so hr has to say you know what if we really want to grow to your point about a c-level executive we know that we need good people and no executive is going to argue that you don't grow with idiots you grow with the best people okay In order to grow with the best people, we need to get the best people. In order to get the best people, we have to shrink that time to hire. We have to make sure that we're getting in front of them where they are. For instance, if you're hiring IT, you might have a a developer, you might look on GitHub as the place where there's a lot of people that that are programming. So you might do some social selling there and trying to understand what the heck they're doing there. Like, because I don't code, I don't understand this stuff like they do but I can learn a lot just by listening and paying attention to reading. So <clears throat> I think it's a tender balance between that. But I would say, again, the, the more up the HR exec looks, the more they're gonna focus on growth and help, the more down they're looking, the more they're gonna be focused on risk. And most HR professionals wanna grow. They get started understanding labor laws. They get under, They get started understanding how to hire people and some of the, the HR rules and things like that, right? They, they get all that and that's nice, but they're also probably took some business classes that at least was a minor for them. Maybe they took a bunch of business classes and they just happened that they got a degree in HR or that was their first or second job. So they want to do more business. It's up to the organization to unleash them to do that better work. Just out of curiosity, let's say you, you, you've done your investigation, you get in, maybe you even you know get past that initial discovery. One of the more complex selling scenarios is when you finally get a chance to make a presentation and there's multiple people in the room where you think you're, you're, about, you're finally ready to show up and, and, and say, here's our proposed solution to the to the various things that you said were important to you. And now there's multiple people in the room with competing interests, or uh, sometimes somebody's there that you didn't even realize, which I think is more prevalent now that we do more of this via Zoom, GoTo, or whatever, just out of curiosity. When you're talking to people and they're going, hey, what do I do? I've got, you know, I send somebody a Zoom link and now three other people show up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, that's fun, right? So uh, that does happen, and that does happen uh, more than we like. The good news is, though, calendar appointments that get forwarded, often we see who accepts the meeting, so we can quickly do a little bit of research. But if not, if we have to do it on the fly, you start the meeting with a quick agenda. Hey, by the way, Raj, thanks for being here today. I, it's good to see you again. And would you, uh, would you mind if we started the meeting with just a quick introduction of the other people here? And maybe one or two things that they'd like to make sure that we cover because, you know, we only have 26 minutes here today for the demo. Of course, we can always schedule more time, but I'd like to make sure that we that we understand what their needs are. Okay, boop, 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 boop. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes they say no. And so hopefully the, the sales pro has been able to find out at least their department and has training and how to sell to that to that person. And really that's where, again, selling with HR, selling with, pick whoever your champion is, pick whoever your influencer is. So who else might need to be involved? Who else might get involved? Is there someone that I should know about? And I might even ask the question. So, hey Raj, can you tell me who might feel left out if they weren't part of this conversation? Oh, oh yeah, for sure, right? Here's this person and that person and they would feel left out or or I use my experience and I say, you know what, normally in an organization of your size, when we, we sell, uh, you know, when, when we sell with uh, y'all, usually there's an IT person that gets involved. Is there an IT person that might be getting involved, not to slow the sale down, but to show that I'm an expert because ultimately, right, sales pros are really consultants. That's all they're doing. They're providing solutions to problems. They're sales consultants. So they have to have some answers ready to go like that. So you have to be prepared. And again, I think competence is more important than confidence because confidence comes. Competence 
gives you that confidence. And it's like, huh, okay, well, I haven't dealt with this before, but I've dealt with something like this before, and I can do this again. Let's keep rolling on the virtual selling piece on, you know, using Zoom, go to WebEx, I don't care which platform, you, you know, is, is perhaps in mind. What are those things that you see that most frequently recur that salespeople do wrong? Well, they, they overshare their screen is a big one. And what I mean is, right, they share screen and they have their bookmarks bar up there. <clears throat> they have, uh, you know, tabs that shouldn't be open, open. They leave it in the shared screen mode instead of going back and forth between shared screen and just the two to five people that are in the room. That's a big one. They don't actually look in the eyeballs of the camera, right? That's a big one. They don't use their hands because they're worried that they're gonna look like they're talking with their hands, but they are, so show your hands, right? In fact, studies show that showing your hands is a sign of trust. You've got nothing to hide here. Um, that's a big one. They just, they, they don't have the equipment, right? They, they just use the default stuff or they leave it on, you know, that's the equivalent of speakerphone, right? They, <clears throat> they do that and then the dog's barking and the kids are yelling and, you know, your spouse is yelling and there goes the lawnmower. And sometimes that happens. I'm not suggesting that people don't forgive that, but control your controllables, right? Control your controllables as much as you can, um, or they have a bunch of junk in their background. I'm, again, I'm not suggesting you need a virtual background. I don't have a virtual background. That's okay. You can. Is it relevant, right? Trying to be too cheeky with that. Or they don't show up more than a minute before the, the meeting starts. And now there's 36 people here and they didn't have time to, to sprint, right? So show up early. Again, use that time to engage and build rapport with people as they come in. Hey, Roger, it's good to see you. Hey, Jim, I wasn't expecting you. Nice to see you. Where are you, where are you at today? All that stuff, again, do that instead of bouncing from meeting to meeting and then not using the tool that's there. I'll tell you, one of the one great thing uh, that I like about Zoom is the annotate tool to draw attention to things that I really want to draw attention to. Simple, simple, simple tool. But most people don't use it. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe they're afraid, whatever, but that's it. And then one last thing I want to share, and that is every day, Reboot your computer, make sure all your updates are ready on your software so that you don't do it right before your first meeting because there's nothing worse than, holy crap, my Mac needs to update and it's got three hours before it's done and I get a meeting in 10 minutes and what do I do? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna pause this update and then IT is gonna be on my button. Oh my God, I don't know what to do. Don't do that. Be ready every day. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. Oh my gosh. No, yeah. I've never done that, right? Yeah, I've done yeah. that too, right? I mean, but I try not to. And if you can control your controllables, you can you can be in control and have a way more successful meeting or event. Yeah, I'm a big fan of asking people how, when they say, well, how do I do this virtually? And whether that's a presentation or anything else, is to ask, what do you do in person? And now let's map and adapt that for the tools that you have, and then finally figure out what you can do new, uniquely, or better or different, right? So for instance, yeah. in a selling scenario, maybe you're selling to somebody that's got multiple offices, and in, in the in-person scenario, you'd have to get in an airplane multiple times, whereas now virtual becomes your friend because you can get everybody in the same room and handle objections in, in, in the same context instead of having multiple conversations. Not a right or a wrong, but definitely a different, if not so in some contexts, uh, you know, more effective. Um, one of the other things that I have often seen is, is the, particularly with regard to uh, virtual selling, this has dropped off significantly since COVID hit and people got a lot more familiar, but salespeople would send out the invite and then somebody would just dial in on the telephone because their paradigm was still a conference call, right? Ah, I yeah. want people to be on video. So part of that in some contexts is, has been me coaching people to say, you want to communicate in advance that you're going to be on video. And 
because that wasn't how ha- hasn't historically been the expectation. Now it, it is significantly more, and you may need to to dial that in based on what industry you might be in. But sometimes people are just used to conference calls, and they're like this Zoom thing, right? Or they join Zoom on their phone, and you have fonts that are too small or something, so they're trying to read your slides on a on a four point three inch, you know, monitor, so to speak, and. Um, Yep, there you go. Curious, when you are training your salespeople, consultants, partners, etc., what question do you wish they would ask you that they often don't? What are their blind spots? Wow, that's a really good question, Raj. I haven't thought about that. So if I think about it, I would say one of the big questions that I, I wish they'd, they'd ask is, how much should I prepare for this meeting? Mm. Should I put it on my calendar? Because I'll, I'll tell you a lot of places, right? If, uh, you know, if they have a rotation of who gets calls, they don't want to block their time for that because they're afraid they're going to lose one of those leads. Well, absolutely you should prep. Now, when should you prep? That's a better question, right? So how much should I prep? I would say, you know, if you've got a if you've got a thirty minute, sixty minute meeting, you should be prepping about that much for it. At least run through it. Make sure the slides look right. Put them in slide mode. Actually present. You know, make sure everything's there. Make sure your transitions. If you're doing transitions, which I probably don't recommend that, but many do. If you're going to use it, make sure they work and it doesn't look jumbled. Right? That it's not. Otherwise, just send them the send them the PowerPoint and tell them to read it themselves. <clears throat> then when, and I would say, you know, first. Know, what, know what's on your calendar tomorrow. Know what's on your calendar tomorrow and then block time appropriately the, that morning or come in earlier, start the day earlier. You know, it's okay. You don't just have to work eight to five. It's fine that you put in a couple extra hours. You know, if you really want to make this work and then I, I wish, I, I, I wish they would talk about and ask about, so how, you know, how how does this you know how does this presentation actually solve their problem? Because a lot of times you know I'm I'm a lot of times in SaaS, and the software it it almost seems so obvious that you want to show it off, like ooh look at this and look at that and look at this look at all my features, and most people don't care about features features just drive more questions right or they think that it's just the standard thing so. You know, if I'm doing whatever I'm doing on my screen share, how does this solve my prospect's problem? I wish they'd ask me that. I wish they'd ask the prospect that, right? So how do you right. see this? Um, and we actually teach that, right? We teach them uh, how, uh, you know, the, the, the piece of that is, so Roger, tell me how this solves your problem with, in our case, right, onboarding. I and like shut up. Yes. Uh, Two thoughts. I love Peter Cohen's book, uh, Great Demo. And he talks about front loading and solving their most important thing first, right? Which is different than a software demo, which tends to be linear from here's how you log in to here's how you navigate to here, right? Um, My variation of that has often been know the story that you're going to tell. And I know these are the three things I want to show them in the software that map to the three problems that they told me that they had, right? Where you go to log in or how you navigate to the you know left hand nav isn't doesn't solve the problem right just cut right to the chase and show them how what you're demoing solves the problem but since the click stream in software is tends to be linear that's how demos tend to tend to end up that way and uh, I'm always just like no just you don't have to show them the whole thing <laughs> you only need to show hard, hard what you need to show stuff. yeah that's right. Um, here's an aphorism that I developed for trainers that I think works well for salespeople. Detail plus dialogue equals duration. You got 30 minutes. So the more you talk, the less you're listening. And, which is, and to me, the power of live is the ability to shut your trap and listen because that's when you learn the things that you need to learn. So how do you talk less and listen more? Detail plus dialogue equals duration. And um, 
they can go to your website and see all the customers you've served or the history of the company or, you know, what you had for breakfast because you posted it on LinkedIn. Um, of course, you don't want to just all ask questions, but you, I don't know, it's just, that's just me. If there's one recurring theme, that's not just an HR issue. That's just a, um, I'm eager to tell you about myself, info barf over PowerPoint issue. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we should be more curious about the other person's world right curiosity wins man that is a great great point uh, just out of curiosity how do you how do you think about helping salespeople develop curiosity creativity investigation skills or those question asking skills those things that lead to that body of knowledge that help you better connect with the person on the other side well, I, I think a lot of times it means you ask a couple more questions. You teach them to ask a few more questions. The surface question, the surface answer to that surface question is seldom anything that's valuable to you. How are you doing today, Raj? Fine. Okay, great. If I just move on from there, I didn't learn anything. So asking more. So tell me about that, Raj. Okay, great. So you're in Oregon. Great. So where in Oregon is that? Oh, well, tell me more about that. Have you been there your whole life? Okay. Or, you know, explain to me that process. Explain to me that, right? Helping them ask that question um, and get, just getting curious to teach that is about asking one more question and one more question and really listening, really listening to what has been said and the body language, right? Are people leaning back? Are they leaning in? Are they looking off in outer space? What are they doing? You know, to teach that, it's prep and practice because that means you get to be present. It's a presentation. Sales is a presentation, right? And yes, it's dialogue, of course it is. But ultimately, you have to be prepared in order to present yes. and to be present, right? That's the other thing. I. What's the story I want to tell ahead of time? How do I get you more curious? Well, I get you to be more comfortable so that your general, genuine curiosity is going to come out. I need you to be more you. And you do that through more practice and more preparation and more preparation and more practice. And you get more curious because most salespeople, the reason that they're salespeople is because they are curious and they do care. But if they don't take the time, they're nervous. They don't take the time to prep, they're nervous. And they're like, oh my gosh, I gotta make sure I get through these seven points. How am I gonna do that? And I've only got 26 minutes to do that in. Well, stop asking that. Start taking the time to prep. Be a master of your craft and then be a master connector. Connect your solution to their problem. And then when you're not sure, Tell me some more about that. Lean in and ask for more. And you teach that just through repetition and continuing to reinforce that and showing them that on the deals that they win, typically they're more curious than on the deals that they lose. And you can do that, you know, lots of good call recording solutions out there, you know, chorus and gong and, you know, take your pick, right? Tons of stuff. As we move toward the end here, I'm going to point out one thing and then I'm going to ask you one final question about tech, tech tools, other tech tools like what sure. you just mentioned. But if you're list still with us, thank you. Uh, and I just want to say I appreciate you being here with us on this uh, Thought Leader conversation with Phil Gerbashak. But I want you to notice, you may even want to go back and rewind the video. Notice what Phil just did. There is a time to go from this and now to bringing it down and leaning in and maybe even slowing down. He's so expert. He, he doesn't even realize. I mean, I've seen Phil present many times, so I, I know what a, what a legit awesome presenter he is. But I just wanted to point out that you probably didn't even think that you were just employing a technique that draws people in, particularly in a virtual world, right? You're going like this and you're doing this and you're doing this. And, you know, and, and if I really need to make a point. <laughs> and that was just brilliant the way that you just did that. Talk to me about some cool little tech tools, 
uh, I know that you love those things and you, you always send me on, on uh, cool ideas. What are some additional little tools that salespeople might think about having in their bag? Well, I would recommend they, they get a subscription to otter.ai, first of all, because then they can record and immediately transcribe, even if it's just their half of the conversation or their half of their practice demo or their half of their practice whatever, because that way they can hear and read what they said and suck the air out of that so they can remove their filler words, so that they can sound more confident, so that they can use will instead of can when they're talking to their prospect, things like that. So otter.ai, <clears throat> great tool. Um, you can just get it on your phone. You don't have to worry about IT blocking you or anything like that. I really like that um, as a tool. Um, I would say, you know, Vidyard, uh, Vidyard is a great tool for sending, uh, you know, a sales uh, video to people. Uh, great, great tool. I really like it. Um, you get notified when they open, um, you know, practice that. It even has a little teleprompt feature, really wonderful tool, big fan of that. Um, and then I'm going to give you one that most salespeople don't, uh, probably don't think enough about, and that is a podcast tool. I would recommend they get Overcast. Uh, Overcast, uh, it's app, it's uh, Mac, uh, Apple only, um, but it'll, uh, you can speed up the podcast. So that you only uh, so that you listen to it at a little faster time, um, I recommend speed it up to two, count to ten, and then drag it back to one and a half, and that'll sound normal for you. And then my favorite podcast uh, that I would recommend subscribing to is Sales Professionals. Right, you get that tool, and then what are you going to listen to? And that is Thirty Minutes to President Presidents Club. Nick Sigelski and uh, Armand Farouk do a, a a great job, just a great job. Uh, breaking sales down 30 minutes to president's club is 30 minutes action based i would tell you though don't don't binge just pick one episode listen to it take some action see how it works for a while and then pick another one um cuz if you binge you're going to be smarter but you're not going to make any more money because you're just going to be smarter i want you to take some action so um, those are three, Raj, that I would, uh, that I would love if uh, more salespeople got. Awesome. Phil, what question should I have asked you today that I haven't asked you? Um, well, I, I think one question that you could have asked is, is why, right? Why, why HR? Uh, why, why, do I, why do I do that? And I would say, uh, you know, and we did kind of talk about this, and that is because of people. I love people. I think a lot of sales professionals love people. Um, and I will tell you, HR people love people that are valuable, love people that share insight, that are confident and competent at what they do. Um, and that's, you know, that's my goal every day with the folks that I train and with myself. Uh, I'm committed to getting better every day. Uh, the reps that I work best with are also committed uh, to getting better every day. Um, so that's why, that's why HR, uh, matters. And, and that's why, you know, that's why sales matters. Phil, let's wrap up by telling our audience where they can find you and your sales show. Sure. Well, um, you can find me probably easiest on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, is super simple. If you can spell Gerbyshack, you can find me it's G E R B Y S H A K. There's a couple of them out there. I'm the only one with probably more than 100 connections, though. Uh, so feel free, uh, follow and or connect. If you connect and you're like, I want to connect, use the three dots and personalize that invite and tell me you heard me uh, on the V2 show, right? Let me know that you heard me here. I'd love to connect with you. Uh, if you're looking for my show, it's on my LinkedIn uh, profile as well. So if you follow along there or you go to Spotify or iTunes, put in Gerbyshack again and you'll find me. It's the yeah. sales leader show. There you go. But you know what? Someone really should start with LinkedIn. And I will say this because, because as I said at the top of the show, Phil is a legit social selling expert. He's got more than 14,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. And, and you will see him model 
the things that he teaches. And that's a really important thing, right? Particularly, you've all seen the bad LinkedIn, right? You connect with somebody and the very next message that you get is, <laughs> shoot me, wait a minute, you don't know me and you're trying to sell me? Yeah, go follow linked, uh, connect with him on LinkedIn and then you can find his podcast or connect on Twitter or, or your preference. With that, I certainly want to, on behalf of our audience, Phil, th say thank you for spending a little bit of time with us here at the V2 Thought Leader Conversations uh, series. And I would look forward to having you back again to talk about maybe even just talking about LinkedIn for an hour or something like that. But sure. I hope that you and yours have a, uh, a fabulous holiday and happy new year. And uh, with that, I'm just going to bid each of you a great farewell. And